Goedemorgen, Onjani and hello. I am Annie Birkes. I'm resident fellow at the Mansueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago. The title of my talk today is Detecting Informal Settlements via Topological Analysis, and it presents the work of our Million Neighborhoods Initiative research team here at the Mansueto Institute. It is an enormous pleasure and privilege to be able to participate in the first State of the Map conference held in Africa. We would like to thank the organizers, especially the scientific committee, for including our paper and for still making the conference possible during what we appreciate has been an extraordinary set of circumstances. A special thanks to the OpenStreetMap community and especially Missing Maps volunteers who have and continue to map and improve the data our project is built on. We would also like to appreciate the communities and practitioners on the ground, especially in Vintuk and Freetown, who indulge us, challenge us, hold us accountable, and remind us that we need to do this work together because knowledge production is a collective and collaborative endeavor, and that our work must be usable for them to drive impact, transformation, and action in their communities. I will kick off our talk today with a brief video to introduce our institute and the Million Neighborhoods Map. I will then move on to contextualize our work within urbanization in sub-Saharan Africa, and then the contribution of our work in terms of methods and application. The inspiration of this work comes from our previous engagements and experiences with communities in sub-Saharan Africa and India. Many slum and informal settlements communities, including those affiliated to Slum Dwellers International, have been developing and refining processes of neighborhood reorganization called blocking out or reblocking to improve accesses, create public open space, and improve security in their settlements. We found the existing models and processes of reblocking often time consuming, approached in piecemeal, costly, and even disruptive socially to the community. We wanted to develop a general I beg your pardon. We wanted to develop a generalizable and systematic method that could help identify at scale at the block level in cities where the most underserviced neighborhoods are and develop tools and methods for analysis to support local communities and their governments to improve and transform conditions in poor neighborhoods. The foundational scientific research using topological analysis was done by Krista Brailsford, Taylor Martin, Joe Hand, and Lewis Betancourt at the Santa Fe Institute. I will include links to these papers at the end of this presentation. The expansion and real-world application of this work has since September 2018 been led by Lewis Betancourt and me here at the Mansueto Institute. The research and computation and therefore full credit to enable a more universal application with a minimum data model that is openly available, was developed and implemented by Satesh Soman, Cooper Nederhood, Nico Marchio, and Annie Yang. The Mansour Institute for Urban Innovation is a new institute at the University of Chicago. It's dedicated to studying the processes that create and sustain cities. When you go to developing cities, the city's still forming, and you'll find many places where people have settled and don't have streets coming in to deliver electricity or sanitation. And it's critical to create all these services that allow people to live good lives. The Million Neighborhoods Map uses this premise of, of connectivity and seeing how well connected are different neighborhoods across a city. Say, for example, I'm the mayor of Monrovia. And we look at this map together with our communities, and what we will see on this map is Two places that light up bright red are West Point and Escado. And so already there we know that these are neighborhoods that are underserviced and in need of infrastructure access. And then this can help elicit a dialogue between the city and the, the communities being able to collectively engage around what this evidence means and how we could move it to actionable intelligence within, within our city. Researchers at the University of Chicago have one of the longest traditions of looking at cities in terms of neighborhoods. When you look at any city, you will find that it often to work at a larger scale misses sort of the, the human touch, the human need. And the idea of the Million Neighborhoods Map is to start mapping cities in this way, to have a whole vision of the world. So in putting it all together, we can see change and learn from examples of success in places and at the same time adapt those solutions to new contexts, like eliminating extreme poverty, creating good urban services everywhere, improving people's health, everywhere on earth, for everyone. Mm. 
It is expected that by 2030, approximately two out of eight people will live in urban slums and urban informal settlements across the world. In 2010, 294 million people lived in sub-Saharan African cities and towns. In the next decade, the sub-region's urban population will grow to a projected 621 million, according to UN data. While megacity Lagos and the other big two, Kinshasa and Greater Johannesburg, will continue to grow, according to analysis by David Satterwave in 2017, the most substantial proportion of the urban population in sub-Saharan Africa do and will live in small and intermediate-sized urban centers where local governments lack responsive urban governance structures, suffering adequacies in the provision of basic services, and have very little capacity or funding to fulfill their responsibility for providing good living conditions and good health for their residents. Human development in terms of life expectancy, education and income in sub-Saharan Africa remains at the low end, below 0.550 out of 1.0. And it is going to require massive collective and coordinated action. And as we dare to advocate, recognizing and seizing the opportunities these cities and their neighborhoods present for sustainable and equitable development over the next 10 years. There has been an unprecedented effort to exploit remote sense data, street view images, machine learning, advances in field work and scientific methods, and special data technologies to detect and understand how cities are growing and where slums and informal settlements or infrastructure deficits are. Among these are the work of Kit and all, Coley and all, Wurm and Taubenberg, and the SETO lab at Yale. Our contribution uses vector data, a topological analysis of building foot footprints in relation to the existing street networks as a pathway towards near universal criteria for determining whether a neighborhood could be an informal settlement. With a topological approach, it is possible to determine the number of building parcels a street inhabitant must cross to access the street network and therefore access for emergency services or connection to sanitation and water. To measure street access, a K index or block complexity, which falls on a non-zero positive integer scale has been defined. When the K index is equal or smaller than two, it means all buildings in the block have direct access to the streets. Values greater than two reflect blocks that are incrementally less accessible. The K index may be interpreted as the number of buildings a person would have to pass as they move from the least accessible building in a block to the nearest external street access. Computationally, the K index is the number of weak deal graph interactions required to cover all buildings in a street block, moving from buildings along the street edge to the innermost building. Focusing on topological invariance allows us to analyze cities without respect to the specific morphology of their street network. To create a global index of underserviced city blocks, we extracted open data on building footprints and street networks from OpenStreetMap and applied a topological analysis to each extracted street block to characterize the level of spatial accessibility. In addition, we used administrative boundary polygons from the database of global administrative areas. Starting with the initial street network, the geometry of the street network can be extracted via the well-studied method of polygonization. In polygonization, the south intersections of the street network are determined in order to define the block geometry. Most GIS packages offer a polygonization feature, for example, estimate polygon from postures. In implementation, though, we found a set theoretic approach to be more stable and performant. By buffering the one-dimensional line strings comprising the street network with a small buffer radius, we obtained two-dimensional polygons capturing the outline of the street network. We then find the set theoretic difference between the administrative boundary polygons and the buffered street network polygon. This renders the negative area between the street network geometry as a collection of polygons. These negative areas are precisely the street blocks we are trying to extract. In Brailsford and All's initial attempts to apply K-index calculations to neighborhood analysis, cadastral maps were readily available. But this is not the case for everywhere in the world. To scale the analysis, a method for approximating cadastral or parcel maps was needed. We use a Voronoi decomposition of the street block geometry with features of the building footprints as inputs to the Voronoi algorithm to approximate building parcel boundaries. 
In a classical decomposition of street block polygons with folding footprint, footprint centroids, often results in cadastral boundaries that intersect the building footprint polygons, CA. This is, of course, not an ac accurate reflection, and finding optimal routes to each building making access requires parcel boundaries that do not intersect building footprints. To guard against these intersections, we instead generate a Voronoi decomposition of the street block polygon using the building footprint vertices and regularly spaced samples of footprint boundaries as input points. Each resulting Voronoi cell whose centroids are vertices of the same building are then union together to provide a cadastral approximation that does not intersect the building footprints as demonstrated in B. With either exact or approximate cadastral delineations, the topographical approach to underserviced neighborhood or informal settlement identification can be applied to every extracted street block in the city, as shown here for Freetown. The cadastral parcels are taken as the initial faces of a planar graph. This planar graph structure has a weak deal, a corresponding graph formed from connecting the centroids of each adjoining parcel centroid. We term this structure a weak dual since incomplete faces are discarded, and so taking the weak dual of the weak dual does not restore the original graph. Instead, successively taking the weak dual of the weak dual forms a sequence of planar graphs. Every sequence of planar graph weak duals will converge to a trivial graph in the form of a tree. The number of weak dual operations required to achieve a trivial graph or the length of the weak dual sequence forms the K-index measuring spatial accessibility. This approach has two advantages. It reduces the problem of dealing with varied morphologies and building block densities across cities, street blocks, to simpler comparisons of scalars. This approach locates precisely what a street block, where the least accessible areas are, by examining the parcels nearest to the final trivial graphs. The graph above shows the summary distribution of block complexities in Freetown, Sierra Leone. We can see that the largest number of blocks do not fall within the higher K-index ranges, i.e. many of the blocks in the city are more or less accessible at low K uh, complexity. With targeted investment and community participation, the city could probably move a large number of residents towards more equitable access to services provision, making gains while developing pathways for the more complex city blocks. What may appear like an insurmountable problem before now shows up as probably quite manageable. More on methods. To convert the cadastral maps to a planar graph, each cadastral parcel's boundary is decomposed into finite segments and aggregated into a collection, while keeping track of the original parcel to which each boundary component belongs. The elements of this collection are compared pairwise where adjacency is established between two parcels if any of their boundary components overlap. For small street blocks, this is not a severe computational bottleneck, but it becomes intractable for the larger street blocks in our data set. To get around this, we build a spatial index of edge components and compare each boundary component to the end closest components that do not belong to the same parcel rather than comparing each component to every other component. We find that N100 is more than sufficient to accurately represent the adjacency and connectedness of observed planar graphs. The spatial index implementation we choose is an R tree, which is a variant of a B tree whose nodes have a fixed number of M objects and contain information about the bounding box of each node's objects. An R tree of node capacity M has insert complexity proportional to M. So building the R tree for C boundary components has overall complexity O in C. With the R tree built, the planar graph construction requires a constant number of comparisons per component in C. So the index construction implementation is linear in the total number of boundary components of the street blocks parcels. The trade-off for this improved performance is the increased memory requirements of maintaining the spatial index, i.e. computational power. With the adjacency structure of each panel determined, the construction of the weak deal is straightforward. For each parcel, we construct an edge from that parcel centroid to the centroid of each adjacent parcel. Then the collection of edges is traced to determine the polygons that will become the faces 
of the current graph's weak deal. Now onto application and to bring us full circle back to what we discussed right in the beginning around reblocking and how we are hoping that this work can help support communities and local governments. With each building's access to the formal street network or lack thereof analyzed, we can now provide suggestions to the local community about how to connect each building to the existing street network while respecting the existing building footprints with potentially minimal cost and disruption. The green lines represent a reblocking proposal for Kibera in Nairobi. In this iteration of the reblocking algorithm, we abandon the efforts involving stochastic graph searches and approach the problem using Steiner tree approximations to gener generate the optimal street network. To frame the universal access network as a Steiner tree problem, we segmentize the building parcel boundaries to create non-terminal nodes at each segment boundary and create a terminal node for each building parcel lacking direct street access by placing a node on the non-street parcel boundary closest to that building. We then construct a complete subgraph of all terminal nodes where the weight of each edge is the Euclidean distance between a pair of terminal nodes. Each existing tree segment has a zero weight. Solving the minimum spanning tree problem on this subgraph and then recovering the original path segment gives us the optimal new street network. Our approach, of course, has limitations. One already mentioned is that we do require exceptional computational power to do the back-end work. However, the map is fully available online and even on your mobile device. Other limitations include false positives. For example, street blocks where lack of public access is intentional, for example, embassies or universities, military bases or enclaves, may show up as informal settlements, as it does here with the US Embassy in Monrovia. It is also possible for a well-known um, slum um, like Neza in Mexico City um, to show up as a well-connected um, neighborhood because it has relatively high levels of street access. Therefore, street level access alone is not a complete determinant of informality or slumness in, within the urban fabric, and other core services may also be lacking. All results of our project are available on our Million Neighborhoods website, and we invite you to visit us. We invite you also to contact us, um, and as our data is freely available to researchers and our code is available on GitHub. As promised, the original scientific work that was first developed by Brailsford and all um, are available at these links. And we look forward to engaging with you on our data um, and also to build this map further. All computation was performed on the university supercomputer known as the Midway, with technical support from the Research Computing Center. We have a suggested data citation, and we also ask that you please credit the OpenStreetMap contributors and the University of Chicago when using and distributing our work. Thank you very much for your attention and we look forward to engaging with you in the questions and answers section and beyond. Please follow us at MI Urban Chicago. Thank you very much. Bye, Yadanki.